There are a handful of movies that make you think to yourself, maybe modern times aren't so bad. Apocalypto falls into that category. After watching Mel Gibson's movie, I've already caught myself thinking, yeah, a dozen eggs cost $6 now, but at least I'm not getting my heart ripped out on an altar. It's a helpful thought to have access to. But Apocalypto does more than just give you a new sense of gratitude. It's also one of the most entertaining movies of the 2000s. From the very first minute, Apocalypto is in an all-out sprint. And it very rarely slows to a jog, much less a walk. That's the power of simple plots. You don't need to tie exposition to your ankles. After our hero is captured, he's on a very short timetable to save his family, and the quest is riveting. Rudy Youngblood deserves a lot of credit for his performance. So if you want to turn your brain off and keep one eye on Apocalypto for pure, non-CGI entertainment, that option is available, which is great. But you can also give the film your full attention and identify themes related to the opening quote. A great civilization is not conquered from without until it has destroyed itself from within. Framing a movie with that idea sets up a difficult task because it's a big idea that typically plays out over decades, if not centuries. And Apocalypto isn't even a three-hour epic. It's a two-hour action movie. What's amazing about Gibson's film is how it uses short but striking imagery to communicate expansive ideas in a small amount of time, starting from the very beginning. Jaguar Paw and his father's tribe live a simple life. They hunt, they have children, and they make fun of anyone who fails at either of those activities. That's about it. Flint's guy even tells the tribe passing by that he hunted the forest with his father, now he hunts with his son, and his son will continue the tradition. He's a great warrior but never had any ambition to expand. His family just took what they needed from their environment. The village is a reflection of this attitude. There is no elite class, there are no slaves. Everyone's playing the same game, which creates sturdy communal bonds. They sit around a fire and listen to an old storyteller, which is a scene I love because it's a reminder of how important stories are to peoples and cultures, and the moral of his story becomes extremely relevant later on. A man sat alone, drenched in deep sadness, is how the story opens. In search of relief, the man asks the creatures of the jungle to give him an array of gifts, superhuman vision, strength, knowledge, and they oblige him. But then an owl tells the rest of the animals, I saw a hole in the man. Deep like a hunger he will never fill. It's what makes him sad and what makes him want. He will go on taking and taking until one day the world will say, I am no more and I have nothing left to give. The villagers are fascinated by the story. I think they see it as a warning not to strive for too much. Better to remain focused on your family and the resources of the forest that provide for them. Nothing else. But the following morning they meet a civilization that does not abide by those limiting principles. And we can recognize that right when the Mayans appear on screen, because their tattoos and piercings are far more extravagant than the ones worn by their victims. The leader of the raiding party, Zero Wolf, wears some of the most badass armor in movie history, very Predator-esque. The village warriors fight as best they can, but they're overwhelmed by the Mayans. Flint Sky's final words to his son are, Don't be afraid. Which is a piece of advice that applies to his son and the civilization capturing him. And it has to be said that the aftermath shots of the village are stunning. Many of them look like paintings, which makes the tragedy feel even more profound. The Mayans don't treat the villagers with any mutual warrior respect. Instead, they humiliate their captives every chance they get. Only Zero Wolf's desire to get warm bodies to the altar prevents more casualties from taking place. The Mayans believe themselves to be above all other cultures, so torture and general brutality are fair game. The strong can treat the weak how they like. Now when the caravan reaches the city apparatus, we discover how the Mayans treat their environment. They walk into a stripped-down forest and are almost flattened by a gigantic tree. As Joan Hill says in Moneyball, It's a metaphor. I know it's a metaphor. But since they can't see the irony from above like we can, a sick little girl appears to make their impending doom undeniable. She tells them that Man Jaguar will lead you to your end. And all they give in return are looks of confusion and concern you get the sense that they know the sacrifices won't be enough. The limestone mine introduces the severe class problem. The poor work themselves to death, so the city rulers can build extravagant buildings. And it's a remarkably interesting visual environment. The earth has literally been sapped of its color. It's just black and white apart from the orange of flames and the red of coughed up blood. It shows the essence of what Mayan society has devolved into. The city center itself is divided into the have and have-nots. Pestilence and famine have broken many of the inhabitants, those with very few piercings and tattoos, 
And then there are the religious and political elite who are covered head to toe with jade jewelry, the defining symbol of wealth of that time. The mountain is being swallowed by a flood, and these are the people at the very top who will be the last to drown. Human sacrifice is the only reaction they can conceive to escape the rising waters. And this is a key point, I think. Things are falling apart, but the leaders can't even consider the possibility that they are responsible. It's not resources being wasted so they can live even more luxuriously. It's the anger of the gods, because only the gods could lay such a powerful civilization low. The Mayans are blinded by pride. The high priest declares that they are destined to be masters of time and nearest to the gods. Because pride makes introspection nearly impossible, when the eclipse is complete, that's it. Pack up the hearts and headless corpses, we have a dinner to get to. That's the Mayan response. Jaguar Paw's escape and eventual survival is another punishment for their arrogance. The strongest Mayan warriors pursue revenge and are knocked off one by one by the environment they've been ripping to pieces in order to craft jewelry and wage war. The arrival of the Spaniards is the final nail in the coffin, of course. The political and religious leaders could ignore pestilence and famine, but war is the horsemen they'll be unable to look past. Apocalypto at its heart, no pun intended, is telling the audience, this is what civilization should be looking out for. If things aren't going particularly well, look to the leaders. Are they saying, we've made some mistakes and we're trying to make good on them? Or are they saying, we sure as hell aren't responsible, all we need to do is sacrifice some people, and all will be dandy. Blame shifting looks very different in the modern context, and that is a positive. Let's just cross our fingers that Congress isn't tossing corpses down the Lincoln Memorial in 25 years. You can never be too sure about these things. But even the less dramatic methods of deflection can be catastrophic in the long term, because problems cannot be solved if they're not acknowledged. Jaguar Paw defeats the Mayans and makes it back to his family because they were the key to his fulfillment. He didn't need to be a ruler, he didn't need jade jewelry, he was content with the hand dealt to him. His enemy had an appetite for power and wealth that could never be satisfied, primarily because the Mayans thought they were always deserving of more. That is the difference worth thinking about, for nations and individuals. Gratitude and humility leads to health and stability, greed and arrogance leads to decay and chaos. There may be a period of glory and prosperity before the decay and chaos, but it will come. You can only get away with things for so long. And that's what we see in Apocalypto. The chickens come home to roost. Apocalypto is not the only great film about downfall in the 2000s. Another one with the title of Downfall was put out in 2004, centered around another group of delusional leaders dead set on blaming others for their own miscalculations. And I made a video on it, which you should definitely check out next. And make sure to subscribe on your way out for more content like this in the future. Have a fantastic rest of your day, guys. I will talk to you soon.